Well, how about the Lions? <laughs> Seahawks. The Seahawks, how did they do? Down 35 nothing they have. Thanks for that word of encouragement. I knew it would be bad, but not that bad. Well, uh, you've had a chance to digest a little bit what we uh, have been talking about. Perhaps you've had a discussion around the uh, lunch table today or in the car, uh, or you've been thinking about this whole uh, kingdom message of Jesus topic and uh, have a question. So I'm wide open right now. Anybody have a question they'd like to ask? It's okay. If you disagree, ask a disagreeable question, all right? <laughs> uh, yes, over here. Is there true salvation without transformation? Is there true salvation without transformation? We're actually going to talk about that tonight. Uh, I think you could say deathbed uh, conversion doesn't have time for transformation, but there is there is at the core of a person's being uh, a transformation process. Now we're going to talk about that a little bit more tomorrow night and the next night. But uh, obviously, the thief on the cross, for instance, did not have a chance to be uh, to live a transformed life. His spirit and attitude were transformed. At the, at the moment. Remember his uh, question to Jesus? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. <laughs> Even the thief on the cross uh, responded to the kingdom message of Jesus. Now, that's the strangest place to find your king. You've got to admit that. I mean, here's Jesus being crucified beside him, and yet he recognized Jesus for who he was, the king of the kingdom of heaven, and asked to be included. And Jesus said, you got it. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So that, that's about the only place where I think you could appropriately say, I think um, all of the illustrations that are used in Scripture are illustrations of growth for the Christian life. They are not static. It's not like I said this morning, you got the ticket to heaven and you don't have to actually do anything else. Um, it, it is a, a life. The life of Jesus, the life of the, of the very God of the universe, comes in in the person of the Holy Spirit, and that life force is the same life force that's operating in creation. Uh, and it is incredibly uh, prolific in terms of reproducing itself. So, thanks for the question. Anybody else? Yes? I've been hard to formulate it in my mind. This is actually a question I'm thinking about for quite a while. I was on a discipleship with a guy for about 10 years back in our old church, mm -hmm. and he always talked about salvation and then surrender, mm -hmm. like you were talking this morning. And he always, he, he would say, they come to the point where you know and you accept Christ's forgiveness, mm -hmm. but then it seems like by the time you hit late 20s, early 30s, you realize you can't do that at all. And uh, so you come to a point where you really yeah. you need to find the So how, as a young person, they come to Christ, they yeah. don't have that life experience of, okay, yeah. I need to repent from this, I need to repent from that. Yeah. How, how do you? Well, you don't, you, you don't necessarily see repentance as something uh, where you're repenting <coughs> from a sin. You see it as repenting for your rebellion. That's the basis of true repentance. If you don't repent for your strong self-will and your need to be in control, which has pushed God off of his, or out of his role, the central role in your life, then you're, it's superfluous to repent of specific sins. Because the big sin is sitting there glaring at you. 
Uh, I, I would have a problem with that particular teaching that you're talking about for this reason. Some of the most incredibly productive, sold out Christians that I've met in my lifetime have been teenagers. They didn't need life experience in order to live a surrendered life or a productive, powerful life. Uh, children who are surrendered to Jesus and who live full out in their innocence. Uh, that yes, they are not acquainted with sin yet. They haven't had a lot of failure yet. But they are uh, living for the king. And 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds can have a powerful influence on their world and, and their friends. Uh, we've got a, a little gal out in uh, the Seattle area that she's actually the daughter of one of my former associates. And uh, she leads people to Christ, children, other children, uh, her own age, she's in junior high right now. But every week, it seems she has another story of someone she's led to Christ. Uh, she, she's just hungry <laughs> to see the new life of Jesus come into the, the lives of her friends. So uh, it, it doesn't have to be uh, till later on that you surrender. Yeah. I think all too often that's the case, however. When life doesn't work, we finally give up. We, we figure out, hey, I can't do this. I don't know how to make it work the way I envisioned it could. Therefore, I need help. And that's when, yeah, 20s, late 20s, early 30s. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, at the end of the 20s, there is a natural passage that most people go through. Some of you are probably in your 20s right now. Um, at the end of the 20s, the beginning of the 30s, there is a time of reevaluation and uh, even doubt. And uh, many, many of the young people that I have worked with, uh, that's when their marriages, for instance, first start struggling. Uh, they've had all the firsts, you know, usually their first, uh, they got married, got their first house, had their first child. Uh, he's gotten his first job or his first raise, all of those kinds of things. All the firsts have happened. And now all of a sudden they're going, is this it? Is this all there is? We just do this the rest of our life? Well, I don't know if that's enough for me. So that's a time when uh, uh, young adults are really uh, open to reassessing whether Jesus Christ is the master of their life. And often he isn't. Therefore, that's a good time to, you know, to, to grab hold of their hearts and say, hey, you would be fulfilled. Uh, life would be rich and sweet if Jesus Christ was in the driver's seat. So let's try that and see what happens. Uh, all right. I'm going to go into uh, what I have prepared for tonight, but to start with, I'd like to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because we're going to talk about the uh, new creation or the transformation that uh, we've been called into, and this passage pretty well lays it out. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse uh, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. And notice the connection between the new birth, the new creation, the transformation process, and outreach. The two are bound together. And that's, since I wrote the book, I didn't write about that in the book, but since I wrote the book, one of the deep things that God has taught me is that you can't have transformation without multiplication. That if you're being transformed into the image of Christ, your life will be fruitful. You will impact other people in a way that moves them toward the kingdom. 
If you're sterile, in other words, if it's been a year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years since you led someone to Christ, I would be very, very worried. Because true transformation always moves you toward multiplication, toward fruit. And the fruit of a Christian's life is other new believers. It's character, right? I mean, we become Christ-like. But the more we become Christ-like, the more attractive, the more startling, the more remarkable our lives are. And that draws other people with questions. And we respond concerning the hope that is within us. Before we go further, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this incredible group of people who came out on a Sunday night. Uh, I, I thank you for a church that's willing to invest this kind of time and effort, uh, concentration on your truth, and I pray that it will pay great dividends here. I pray that there will be a significant number of life changes that will impel this church into an even more productive phase. I pray that, that you would trust this church with more and more new life, new <coughs> believers, beginners. And I ask, Father, that they would care well for those new Christians. I pray that this would be a thriving place where people who are hungry for you, who are in pursuit of you, who are seeking you, would find you and where you would find the ones who are damaged and helpless and hopeless. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would rescue many here in this area through this body of believers. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to talk about how the change process works. And I told you this morning, there's an event of repentance followed by a lifestyle of repentance. There's a pro an event. It should take place when you come to Christ. There should be a surrender, not just believing in Christ, not just accepting what he did for you, but letting him be who he is. Letting him be the king of your life. All right, at that point, something's on the table. But you're incapable of saying, God, I surrender all. I mean, we sing that, don't no, we? I mean, at least we used to. You know, I surrender all, I surrender all. To Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. And with the best of intentions, we sing songs like that. But when you come to Christ, there's usually a point of rebellion. There is some issue that you've been going like this to God. Of. And when you drop that hand, when you, when you stop grasping, onto your own life and open your hands, then God for the first time can pour in His grace and His salvation, and He does. But there's always an issue at the point of salvation. And if there isn't, if you, if you, don't, if you have an issue but you don't address it at the point of salvation, you say, look, I want the benefits but I don't want a divine takeover. Uh, you know, I, I want to go to heaven when I die, but I don't want you in charge of my life, you got a problem because you're dealing with the Savior who is also the Lord of all. You gotta remember who he is. He's not just your fixer. He's your king. And so when salvation takes place, uh, that should begin. The, the change process is what we're going to look at next. And uh, I'd like to just simply go over the language that Jesus favored. He liked to use, follow me. And he used it more than he used believe in me or trust me. For instance, in, in Matthew 4.19, Jesus says, come follow me. Now he's talking to Peter, James, and John. And he's recruiting the fishermen is the initial disciples. Matthew 8, 22, Jesus told him, follow me. Matthew 9, 9, 
follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. I don't know how that happened. I mean, I, I, I've got this picture in my mind of Jesus walking up to Matthew's tax table or booth or whatever it was in the marketplace and just looking him in the eye and saying, come follow me. I got a hunch there's a little bit more to the story than that. I, they may have had an encounter before. I don't know. Uh, all I know is that in an amazing way, Matthew went, okay. I mean, I doubt if many of us would have done that. You know, if a religious leader comes up to you when you're at work doing your thing <laughs> and says, come follow me, you're going to say, well, I'm not off till 4.30 or whatever. Uh, let me ask my boss if I can get the day off. I mean, just to, to drop it and follow is remarkable. But that's what Jesus asked him to do. Matthew 10, 38, anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy. Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 19, 21. Sell your possessions. This is the rich young ruler story. Sell your possessions, give them to the poor, and then come follow me. Remember what the rich young ruler did? He went away sad because he had many possessions. That's when Jesus had that discussion with his disciples about how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. His possessions were his kingdom. His, his possessions were the center of what he thought he had to have other than God. And that's why it's so hard for a rich man to give that up. Jesus asked him, open your hands and I'll pour my kingdom in but I can't give you my kingdom when you're full of your own kingdom. All right? John 8, 12, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 10, 4, his sheep follow him because they know his voice. John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they Follow me. So, are you one of his sheep? Then following shouldn't be an issue. Because his sheep know his voice and they follow him. That's a given. If you are his sheep, if you're your own sheep, then you will say, well, I'll follow when I'm darn good and ready. I'll follow someday. I know I should follow, but I've got some issues right now. When I get those cleared up, then I'll follow. Jesus said, if you're his sheep, you hear his voice, you know his voice, and his sheep follow what does that say about the Christian life? It's a following lifestyle. So, following, let's just define it. What does it imply? Following means the leadership issue is resolved. It's settled in Jesus' favor. I am no longer following my own self-interest. When I came to Jesus Christ, and found in him my Savior and my Lord, I began to follow him. Which means, the issue of who the leader is, and who the follower is, has been settled. I'm the follower. He's the leader. And that makes all the difference, right there. There's no longer the, uh, the decision every time of, okay, should I or shouldn't I? My lifestyle choice is I'm a follower, he's the leader. And following is a process. 
It's not just a one-time decision. When you're following somebody, they take a step and you take a step, right? That's the way that works. We follow in a process. Our leader goes before us, we follow after. Now, it's that simple, but if we can only get that in our heads, that's what we're doing day after day. He's leading, I'm following. So the attitude of my heart is one of surrender to the direction uh, and the will of my leader. So the process of letting God lead um, is about letting his agenda take over where my agenda used to rule. This is one of the ways we talk about our own self-rule now. We say, well, he or she really has an agenda. What, what we mean by that is they have this sense of what they need to do or how they need to live. And that, that issue of my agenda can absolutely separate you from God. I need to do this. I understand what Jesus did on the cross. I understand that that's true. I understand that I should access that. I understand that Jesus Christ is the King of the universe, and I know that He should be running my life, but I have some things to do. There's some things I want to do with my life first. I have met many people like that. They don't have a problem with the Bible. They don't have a problem with the Gospel. They don't have a problem with Jesus, in the sense of it being true. They have a problem with following. After my agenda is satisfied, then maybe I'll get serious. Here's a person who has, to the best of their ability, let God's agenda begin. Okay, this is the point of salvation. This person has been to the cross. God's agenda is now operating. That doesn't mean their own agenda, their own will, their own willfulness is God. It means that God's agenda has been invited in, in Christ. All right, this person now discovers that letting God have his way, letting God lead, is not easy. In fact, it presents many problems. A lot of new Christians find this up. They, they enthusiastically embrace the salvation that is in Jesus Christ, and then they go, whoops, do you realize what this means? <laughs> I'm going to have to change. And so here's a person who has faltered in their original intent. In other words, God's agenda was welcomed, and then it wasn't so welcome. And many of us know what that is. We know what, what that's like to have that happen. And this person's agenda has now gotten stronger again. But as the Holy Spirit works in their life, as the truth of God's Word works in their life, as they fellowship with other Christians who are growing and becoming in this process of transformation, God's agenda, now this was a low point, now it starts back up again. And many of us have had that experience where there was a time where we were wholeheartedly enthusiastic, maybe in our youth. And then we went into a period of decline. And then God's Word gripped us, God's people surrounded us, God brought events into our lives, and we got back on track. And we offered Him fresh surrender, and His agenda began to claim a priority in our lives. Our agenda began to decrease. I think this is the kind of thing uh, John the Baptist was talking about in John 3, when he said, he must increase, I must decrease. It's not like Jesus needs to increase. I mean, he's everything he will ever be already. <laughs> he's the biggest personality in, in our experience in the universe. But my ability to let him be Jesus, the God of the universe in me, that needs to increase. To do that, if he's going to increase in his influence and control, 
I'm going to have to decrease in my influence and control. So here's a mature person. Doesn't mean that they never struggle with their own uh, agenda, with their own issues, control issues. It just simply means that most of the time, God's agenda wins. God is in control of this. This is mature. This is what an older Christian should look like. Now let me just say this with all kindness and respect and love. I've been a pastor for 44 years. I've been involved in a lot of different ministries in many different churches. I've spoken in a lot of churches about this subject, like I'm speaking here. One of the things that has astonished me and broken my heart has been the condition of the older Christians. People who've been in the church for 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 60 years. The pillars, you know, of the church, they've been there forever. They know it all. But this isn't happening. God's agenda hasn't taken over. Their agenda is stronger than ever. All you have to do is have a church conflict. In other words, a disagreement about what we should do together. Should we raise funds for a new building? Should we change something about the worship? Uh, should we do this project in the community? And there's room for disagreement, and there's room for discussion, and an honest, loving group of people can handle disagreement and discussion. But when the control issues of the older Christians rise in the church, the church becomes a very dangerous place. Older Christians will break up their church to prove they are right. To win the argument. And that's the, that's the most incredible thing I can imagine. I mean, here, here are people who've been giving, a lot of them have been giving 10% for years. They've invested in this church. They know the people of the church. They know the children of the church. And yet, when push comes to shove, getting my way is more important to me than all these other lives. I'm right. And because I'm right, therefore, I should have my way. And if these people don't agree with me and they don't go my way, I'm going to do all the damage I can. On my way out the door. Or on their way out the door. Let's be honest about it. A lot of the churches around here are not the result of strategic church planting. They're the results of church splits. There's 36 different kinds of Baptists. Do you think that was God's plan? <laughs> I don't. I think that's the result of strong old people not following Jesus, doing their own thing in terms of controlling their church, and blowing it up, and the pieces fly everywhere. And then we wonder why our children and grandchildren have a difficult time believing. What did they learn from us? How to fight. How to be nasty with our tongues. How to backbite. How to slander. How to be malicious. And if you think your kids don't hear what you say, if you think they don't smell the attitude, you have no idea how perceptive they are. So, what's at stake in you and I letting God have his way? Becoming sweeter? Becoming more loving? More merciful? More giving as we get older? The next generation is what's at stake and the believability of our message. Illustration number two. 
Here, well, first of all, let me, let me go over a, a biblical transformation vocabulary. I did this with the Old Testament on this morning on the subject of sin. Let me do it on the subject of surrender. What God is asking uh, in the New Testament is put in many different ways. It, there's not just one term for it. Repentance is a key term. Surrender is a key term. But God uses all of these different words. Yield, obey, submit, repent, humble yourself, follow. Give up. Then there's give over. Be filled. That's, a, that, that's emptying yourself so that God's Spirit can fill you. Live in Christ. Depend upon Christ. Look to Jesus. Imitate Christ. Be transformed into the image of Christ. All right, that's a transformation language. Give out. In other words, this isn't a one-shot deal. Make every effort over a lifetime. Grow in grace. Stand firm. Fight the good fight. Produce fruit. Shine. Reflect. Now, you could say, oh, well, it's simpler than that. It's just living by faith. Okay, if that's how you define faith. And that's what we should do. In other words, when the scripture says we live by faith, we walk by faith, not by sight, okay, what is that? That's not just believing something. That's getting your arms around all of the active verbs that the New Testament gives us. Here's a list of some of them. And right here is a lifetime's work. Right? You got this all figured out? You got this all in here? I haven't yet. But that's where I'm going. Absolutely, that's where I'm going. Okay, second illustration, how the transformation process works. And this, this is a really important one because we're going to talk about strongholds. And you and I have struggles. We have struggles with holdout areas in our lives. This is exceedingly uh, practical. When you first come to Christ, it feels like, okay, I have invited his kingdom in. All right? If you've truly surrendered again, it feels like, God, you can have me. You can have all my life. What we don't understand is how tricky our inner life is and how powerful the subliminal stuff of our subconscious is. All right? Some of the wounds and some of the messages that were given to us when we were young play in our minds. And what happens is, although we should be taking every thought captive to Christ, and I'm going to read the, the passage that this teaching is based on. Paul says this, he said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. All right, let, follow me uh, carefully. Here's a person who has come to Christ and the overall control issue is subtle. No question about that. They are serious in their surrender. But there are specific control issues and they always swirl around or fasten themselves to a lie. That's why the deceit of our enemy, the, the language of lies that Satan uses, aimed at you as an individual, will raise in you fears and control issues that you didn't realize were that powerful. So these little kingdoms within now, I would call those strongholds or holdouts. And God is very gracious with us. He doesn't expose all of that at one time. He exposes them gently, and the Holy Spirit is relentless about it. He gets you in touch with your issues. Faithful friends who are committed to Jesus will help you because these are usually blind spots, and a blind spot is a blind spot. You don't see it. It takes someone else who loves you, your wife, your husband, your kids, your parents, your friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ, it takes someone to come alongside you and lovingly say, 
There's something you're not seeing. Now, most control issues are up underneath our ego. <laughs> they're, they're something you can't see, but it's really obvious to people who are close to you or who know you. They can see it. It's just under the shadow of your ego. The cross resolves these issues. In other words, it resolved the initial deal. Uh, when you came to Christ, you, you bring these things one at a time as you become aware of them to the cross. And this is what it means to take up your cross daily. The process of letting your sin go and letting Jesus cleanse it and forgive it is a lifetime process. Let me just give you some examples of how we do this, all right? This is in the book, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit deeper about it tonight. This is the person who uses the argument of exceptionism. I have had this happen so many times in my life where people come to me and say, Pastor Jan, I really believe the Christian life works for you. I can see that in you. I respect what you have become. But you, you don't understand. I'm different. I'm an exception. My life situation is such that I can't be obedient to Jesus like you are. Hundreds of people have told me things like that, or words to that effect. Okay, here's how it works. I can't obey God. I'm different. My past makes me different. I come from a dysfunctional family. I remember I mentioned that this morning. You don't understand how bad my family life was. I am, they messed me up. I've, I've repeatedly failed in different enterprises and things I've attempted in my life. I'm a failure. That's my self-image. I've made disastrous mistakes. <clears throat> I live with constant disappointment. Oh, how I wish I could go back and do it over. I have done such stupid <laughs> things. I have messed up my life so bad. I've messed up other people's lives so badly. I'm just so disappointed with myself. And then, of course, despair and depression. I am such a mess. I am such a wreck. I am so unworthy. How am I going to get through this day? Okay, thanks, Doc, for the pills. You see, Jan, I can't live the Christian life. I am, I am so disappointed. I am so depressed. I am living in despair. I feel like a failure. I've been wounded and abused in my past. How can you expect the Christian life to work for me? Here's another one. My pain makes me an exception. I was raped. I was abused sexually, physically, verbally, emotionally. I was a victim. I was victimized as a child and as a teenager or as a spouse. I've had serious illness for a long time. I live constantly with doctors and hospitals and medicine and you name it. And I'm so sick of being sick. I had a bad accident, and it's changed my life. I, I live with disability now. And my life, whole life has been turned upside down by this accident. I've had people in my world die. I, I had uh, a young lady who used to play the organ in one of the churches I served. And in a period of a, a little over a year, she had seven people in her world, her life circle, die. Her parents died, her sister died, her brother died, a couple of cousins died, an uncle died, and her grandparents died. I mean, it was just one after another. And she said, I am so afraid to answer the phone. It feels like somebody else is going to die every time I hear the phone ring. All right. Her whole reason for telling me that is, Pastor Jen, I have had to put my Christian life on hold 
because I am so full of grief and loss. Here's another one. My poverty makes me an exception. I don't have the advantages of other people. I don't have any talents. I'm not very smart. I don't have many financial resources. I don't have any willpower. I've tried, tried, and tried. Can't make it work. I don't have any friends. I'm, I think of myself as poor. And therefore, uh, in my poverty, I can't. I, I, you can't expect me. I mean, look at the rest of the people in our church. They have family. They have houses. They have cars. They have jobs. They have money. They have what they want. They can do and go. And I can't do that. I'm living in government housing. I'm living on the dole. I, I buy food with food stamps. How can the Christian life work for me? My poor self-image makes me an exception. You see, my family wasn't just dysfunctional. Uh, my father was a very, very painful man to live with. He not only never affirmed me, he rejected me. He always picked on me. He told me what I wasn't, not what I was. He criticized me. I lived with his criticism the whole time I was in my home. And then I got married and my husband betrayed me and went off with another woman. I was abandoned by my husband or my wife. I feel so unloved and so unworthy of being loved. For some reason, nobody loves me. I can't trust anybody's affection because they always let me down. Okay. Now, have I painted this pretty close to reality for a lot of people? All right. Listen carefully. None of those reasons are adequate for not following Jesus. None of them. Nothing on that list of what we've just gone through is a reason to either not follow Jesus or stop following Jesus. In fact, every one of them is a reason to follow Jesus. Here's the strangest thing. People who say, I can't follow Jesus because, and then they've got their exception clause are right alongside of people who have the same life experience and they say, I can follow Jesus, I have to follow Jesus, I don't have any other choice but to follow Jesus, I will follow Jesus in my pain, in my poverty, in my poor self-image. I'm going to follow Jesus. He's my only hope. And I've, I've watched people who have had the worst possible life situation begin following Jesus and watch them come out of it as new creatures in Christ like you just can't believe. It's so breathtaking. It's so beautiful to see that happen. And then I've seen people, the same problems, and they go just the other way. I'm here tonight to tell you, if you've been using the exception clause, my life situation is such that I can't really get on board with following Jesus. You're fooling yourself. You're believing a lie. That's a stronghold. That's the kind of thing Satan plants in us. And then it becomes a little castle in our hearts that keeps Jesus from taking over our whole life. Here's another kind of exceptionism, just quickly. I don't need God's control over me because I'm better than others. Um, my intellect. I have an excellent memory. I'm clever. I'm quick. I'm aware. I have brilliant deductive ability. My mind works better than most people I know. My accomplishments. I come from a great family. 
I have a five-star education, I have spaghetti after my name, I'm, I have a successful career, I have wealth, I have power, influence, position, celebrity status, you name it, I'm somebody. So why should I have to follow Jesus? He's lucky to have me. <laughs> My giftedness. I have enormous talent, if you only knew who you're talking to. Uh, I have superior strength and uh, physical ability. I'm quite an athlete, if I must say so myself. Uh, I'm actually quite ingenious. I, I have artistic ability. I can write poetry. I can write books. Uh, you have to realize, God is really lucky if I get on board, because he's really got a treasure. I'm somewhere. My moral goodness. I have been a good girl or a good boy all my life. I've followed the rules. I've done what my community said was the right thing to do. I, have, I make consistently wise choices. I do many good deeds. I usually find the high moral ground. I have a better performance than most. In fact, even before I was a Christian, I had a better Christian life than most Christians that I knew. All right, this is the kind of person who just really sees their own ability and superiority and that they're so impressed with themselves. We have a word for that. What is it? Pride. You think pride's a problem with people? Oh my goodness. Of course, everybody else but you and me. <laughs> so what we do is we destroy this stronghold. I'm an exception. For any reason, positive or negative reasons, it's got to go. I am not an exception. I am unique. I am loved by God. I am special. But I am not an exception. The rules apply to me. The universe doesn't bow to me. And neither does Jesus Christ. I bow to him. So i got to deal with a lie, however. For whatever reason, I'm believing this thing. Whatever got, in, got implanted in my mind that I think I have to believe this, I've got to deal with it. So I use truth. That's daily being in God's Word. When you soak in the truth of God's Word, it gradually gets your eyes open. It pries your eyes open to yourself. And you start seeing things that you didn't see before, even though you read that passage a million times. And suddenly it opens up to you. There's no uh, substitute for letting God's Word have its way in your life. Then there's the battering ram of spiritual gifts. By that I mean other Christians' spiritual gifts. There are people with gifts of discernment. There are gifts of teaching. There are gifts of faith. There are people who are able to speak into your life. And if you let yourself get close enough to them, and you trust them, trust the Lord Jesus in them, trust their spiritual gifts, they can keep telling you things in love and in grace and in mercy. They're not leaving you. They're not abandoning you. They're not rejecting you. They're telling you the truth in love. We're supposed to do that, right? Isn't that what the New Testament says? We don't do that. But we should. And the battering ram of spiritual gifts breaks down this wall and then there's always the scaling ladder of fresh repentance. Fresh repentance is always in season. You and I uh, can always keep surrender. And especially when God opens our eyes to a place where we haven't been letting God have control, what do you do next? You don't despair, you don't say, what a klutz, what an idiot, I should just give up, I'm never going to make it. No. You say, okay, I'm back to the drawing board. I'm fresh surrender. I'm on with the process of repentance. Taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It's a wonderful life. It's not hard. Because who's leading? Jesus. Who's following? Okay, will my leader... Look back occasionally, see whether I'm following him. You know what he does. Does he notice if I don't follow him? Yes. Does he put any pressure on or does he get his arms around me and lift me up? Yeah. 
The discipline of the Lord is faithful. Last illustration, and then we'll go. This is, I call it the pie illustration. It's my favorite one in the whole book. If you uh, have read Follow Me. Following from the inside out, and this is a little bit different. This is an electronic version of that illustration. So, here's a person who has come to Christ, and they genuinely have been born again. The Holy Spirit is in their life. The Holy Spirit lives in our human spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. Okay, so this person is born again. The Holy Spirit resides in the life. This, however, is a picture of how complex we are. We are compartmentalized human beings. You, you cannot get around that. You have an incredible ability to close the door on one compartment and move into another one that has a different set of rules, a different set of behaviors. You know that that's true. You, you can leave the church where you've got one set of behaviors on a Sunday morning, climb into the car with your family, and they're wrangling and fighting with each other about where to eat lunch, and suddenly there's a new set of rules in a new situation. You can go to work, and there's a whole new set of rules and expectations, right? It's a different compartment. And you can leave home where you've just had devotions with your family and go to work and be have a bunch of junk on your, on your plate. You get there and there's problems. And you go, oh no, this is going to be a long day. But it's a whole different environment, a different set of rules. Life works differently at work. All I want to say is that there, this is true. We do have compartments and I've just put down arbitrarily some of the ones that I have in my life and I've seen in other people's lives. This isn't um, inspired. Uh, you can add or subtract categories, but I would suggest that you make a map like this of your own life. Because here's what, what I've got, is that the burgundy part here, uh, this stuff, that part of your life is the part that is not yet surrendered to Christ. The uh, lavender or lilac color in the center, right close around the uh, Holy Spirit circle there, that's the part that has already surrendered. That's the kingdom of Christ having come in your life. Now, as you grow in Christ, what happens is that the control of the Holy Spirit moves from the inside out in the categories. But you'll notice that all the categories don't move at the same time. That should not surprise you, and it should not discourage you. As you grow in Christ, He will take over more and more of the territory of your life. That is the growth process. That's maturity. That's God's agenda becoming your agenda. All right? But it isn't neat and pretty. It's often messy. And there are usually compartments where you're lagging behind this is one of the reasons we are told in Scripture not to judge each other. Because you might have a compartment, let's say uh, your spiritual disciplines, I want the bottom one now, on the left, this one right here. Your spiritual disciplines are really high. You have a quiet time. And you meet another Christian and they don't. Are you supposed to judge that Christian because you have a quiet time and they don't? We usually do, though. We measure other people by our strengths, by our successes. The fact of the matter is, they may have some successes that far exceed ours in other categories. Right? This is a real person. I, uh, I, I watched this person from the time he first came to Christ. He was a drug addict. His life was as messed up as any person I've ever met. He turned his life over to Jesus. He began to follow Jesus. And the first thing that happened was his addictions were put on the altar. When he came to Christ, that was the presenting issue. He was an alcoholic. He was a drug addict. He put it on the altar and said, it's yours. My addictions are yours. And Jesus took them away. 
It was an amazing, wonderful experience to watch his life clean up. And pretty soon he was sober. Now, do you think he might have had a problem with other people who were struggling with addictions? He did. He had a little problem with arrogance. Uh, why, I got cleaned up, why aren't you? you know. All right, he also uh, got right into the Word. He developed uh, Bible memory. He started memorizing Scripture, and uh, some wonderful things happened. His work life picked up. He, he already was bright and brilliant in some areas of his life, and at work, uh, he began to really prosper. But, you notice here his appetite for food? This one? See how far down that one is? What do you think happened? When he stopped smoking, drugging, and drinking, what did he start doing? Eating. Eating. It never dawned on him that Jesus could or should control his food intake. He never prayed about that. He ate what he felt like eating, when he felt like eating, and he ate as much as he felt like eating, right? His, his food life was not, he didn't regard that as Christ's territory. That was his territory. So, what he was doing, sorry, what he was doing was saying no to his leader, to his Lord. Now he is saying yes, you know, in some of these vital areas. These are the yeses. Wonderful yeses. And he was really impressed with his yeses. <laughs> so much so that he didn't really understand the impact of his no's. Because what, what do we know about no's? When you say no to Jesus, what happens? Shuts off the grace of God. It takes on a life of its own. You can't control it now. No's have a ripple effect. When you say no, Lord, think of what you're saying. No, Lord. It's craziness. But what was happening is he had a couple of these no's, and no's have a ripple effect. They start spreading. Now, yeses do too. You know, yeses have an effect on other compartments. They have a, a ripple effect. But this is why you have to so seriously, you have to take so seriously a no. When you start saying no, Jesus, you can't have that area. That's my area. I don't think I can trust you with that area. I don't think I'll like my life if you're in control of that area. I don't think I'll have as much fun if you're in control of that area. So no. Or a passive aggressive. Yes, I hear your voice. I hear the conviction of the Spirit. I hear your word, and I will. It just drags up. And it's been 10 years, and you still haven't said a clear yes. All right. Why is this so important? Because some of you are harboring no's. You come here tonight, and you're, you're really attracted to the message. But as soon as I say this, and we look at the various compartments, I may not have your compartment up here, but some of you know that you have been saying N-O to your leader. And all I'm going to do is ask you tonight to start saying yes where you've been saying no. Is that fair? On behalf of Jesus, the one who deserves our, to be our leader. He deserves our loyalty. He deserves our submission. He deserves our repentance. He should be in charge of every area of our lives. Let's just simply stop holding out. Right now. Tonight. Would you pray with me? With your heads bowed and eyes closed. This is intensely personal, I know, but nobody can see your heart except God.
The Holy Spirit is there. If you're a Christian, He's there with you. He's living within you. If He's put His finger on something tonight, <coughs> then would you consider saying yes where you have been saying no to the leadership and control of Jesus? seems like a simple thing, but profound changes could be happening right now in this room. Marriages could be saved because you start saying yes to Jesus instead of no. Your health could improve because you're starting to say yes instead of no. Your children could see the reality of the Christian life because you're saying yes instead of no. <coughs> Your grandchildren. Other people's salvation could be at stake here. And whether it's believable or not, the message. Because you're, you start saying yes instead of no. A lot can be at stake. And so from the depths of your heart, with all that is within you, would you just say, Lord Jesus, take over where I have been resisting. Pry my sticky fingers off this area where I felt like I had to stay in control. Break down my strongholds. Open up your agenda to an even greater extent in my life so that you can use me, so that I can be productive, so that other people will find Jesus through me. Lord, I will stop saying no. I will say yes. Heavenly Father, I ask that tonight there will be those who say, Jesus, you are enough for my marriage. I don't have to punish my spouse. I don't have to badger and bully them into what I think they ought to be. I can let you work in their heart. I'm going to let them go. I'm going to stop playing God and Holy Spirit in their life. Or there might be someone who says, I've been holding on desperately to what I make, to my money. It's painful for me to give to the church or to any ministry. I've, I've started and then I've quit. I, I now tip God instead of tithe. And Lord, I'm going to stop saying no in my giving. You have it all. I, I'm not just going to give you 10%. You have everything I make. You have everything I own. You deserve to lead me in my financial area. Or there might be someone who says, I've always thought I was oversexed. I've been obsessed for most of my life with thoughts of sex. And that's been my own private little world. And the Christian life works everywhere else but there. And I, I can't imagine life if I gave that up to Jesus. I enjoy it. I enjoy my fantasy life. I feed my fantasy life. I know I shouldn't, but I do. Sometimes I feel dirty, but a lot of the times I get pleasure. Tonight would be a good time to say, Jesus, you are, you are the Lord of my sexuality. You bring sanity. You bring balance. You bring pleasure in all the right ways. And I'll stop trying to be the Lord of that area of my life. I'll say yes where I have been saying no. 
I've given you three illustrations here in my prayer, but what I'm asking of you folks is please take this seriously. It will change your life. Your life will be transformed in new ways if you just stop saying no and start saying yes. Lord Jesus, would you just take us, take these offerings that we're giving you right now, take these yeses and turn them into great victories for your glory and for our blessing. May this church take a huge lurch forward because of all the no's that were turned into yeses in this room tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.